All right, this morning you guys want to get out your Bibles, make your way to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 is our destination. And to catch you up to speed, to where we are at this point in Ezekiel, chapters 1 through 32 consist of prophecies of judgment, judgment that will be poured out on the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom, and its capital city, Jerusalem, and then nations surrounding Jerusalem. In chapter 33, we have a historical account of Jerusalem actually being judged, which is the fulfillment of all those prophecies of judgment. And then when we get to chapter 34, all the way to the end of the book, chapter 48, we have prophecies of restoration. At the bleakest point in the nation of Israel's history to date, that's where God starts to really emphasize beauty and restoration. It's where he shows up the most obviously. Now, some of the restoration is near. When he talks about them coming back into the land, they will do that in just a few decades from the time of the writing. But a lot of it is uh, far when we think about the restoration in the last days. And to understand the last days, you need to understand that biblically the last days started with Jesus' first coming and it consummates with Jesus' second coming, which means we've been in the last days for about 2,000 years. But the last day, or the day that Jesus physically returns and judges the world and sets things right physically, uh, that is the end of the last days. And much of this points to the end of the last days. So most of the restoration that he shares over the next few chapters is far, and by far I mean either beginning with the time that we live in, in the latter part of the last days, or uh, what we call the millennial 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ, as uh, seen in Revelation chapter 20. Now, what I want to do is this, because if you know anything about uh, ologies, and ologies are uh, the study of, and we in, uh, in Christian theology tack an ology onto anything, right? So you have the study of the Holy Spirit, that's pneumatology, you have the study of salvation, that's soteriology. And you have the study of the end times or the last things, that's eschatology. The two ologies that people like to uh, thumb wrestle over the most, I think, are soteriology and eschatology. And for whatever reason, they really like to plant their flag and get really upset or ignore eschatology altogether. They kind of drift to one of those two extremes. And I recall years ago, and I'd say 12 or 13 years ago, the church was very, very small. And I began to teach Revelation. And so I, I did then what I'm getting ready to do for you over the next 10 minutes, whether you like it or not. And that's lay out the four main views on eschatology, uh, specifically the millennial reign. And there may be 50 people in the room. And before I could even get through number two, two families got out and walked out. Just walked off. Didn't come back. So um, just, hey, take a deep breath. <laughs> we, uh, we, may, we, may, uh, we may land where you land, we may give you some information you didn't have, or we may land where you, uh, you, know, you don't consider yourself kind of on that landing strip, but just take a deep breath and at least leave afterwards. Okay, that's my only request. So what I want to do is, is begin, because so much of the book is about the thousand-year reign of Christ when we think about restoration. Like, I want to walk through... I'll give you five uh, main uh, perspectives on the millennial uh, reign. And uh, so let's begin with the first two being symbolic. These are in no certain order other than the first two are symbolic. So all millennialism is an idea that uh, we in the church age are now in the millennium. And so what they believe is that because Israel was disobedient. They forfeited their promises of God, and the church has replaced Israel. The church is now uh, the spiritual Israel, and that 
Uh, because they see a lot of the judgment as symbolic, there's no tribulation because most of Revelation and, and what it uh, describes there, for the most part, is allegory or symbolic. And so we're actually in the millennial kingdom until Christ returns at the end of it. Which I always tell this joke, and if you're an amillennialist, you won't think it's funny. Uh, that's if we're the... If we're in the millennium now, then based upon what I know about Revelation 20, Satan's chain is too long, right? So if you don't know Revelation 20, that won't be funny. And apparently it wasn't all that funny. Or there's a lot of amillennialists in here. Uh, second, uh, postmillennialism. Postmillennialists also see the millennial kingdom as symbolic. And their idea is that um, we are not necessarily in the millennium because they don't really believe in one, but that the world is going to become better and better and better as the gospel goes around the globe until it's, it's fit for Christ to come back. So kind of generally, we're going to clean it up for Christ to come back. And then, you know, the old joke or statement about post-millennialism is that that should have fallen out of favor after the Second World War. Like, we're not getting better as a society uh, it doesn't seem like that is the way we're trending. They also don't have a place literally for Israel because they believe the church embodies those promises. And uh, they don't believe in a tribulation because they would say that most of what takes place in Revelation happened in 70 AD when Jerusalem fell for a second time. So that's kind of their, their trajectory. Those are the two most popular symbolic ideas about the millennial kingdom. Uh, then we have the two literal ones, the first one being historic pre-millennialism. And what it says is that while the church does uh, inherit the promises of Israel, there's going to be a time where God does judge the earth, a tribulation period. The church will go through that tribulation period. And then at the end of that tribulation period, uh, the church will be taken up as Jesus comes down. There'll be a whole uh, rapture and Jesus' second coming all in one event. And then there will be a millennial kingdom, um, but uh, it will be where Christ rules and reigns. And yet uh, it's not really, even though there are uh, sacrifices in the temple and all this stuff that goes on, it won't be inherently uh, Jewish at heart. God won't use them as the vehicle for salvation, nor will he necessarily fulfill all the promises uh, made to specifically Abraham and David. So that's historic premillennialism and Really, the key difference between these two that I'm going to uh, give you that are literal is this group goes through uh, the tribulation. They're gearing up for uh, really, really tough times before uh, Jesus comes back. The fourth perspective, as if we didn't have enough syllables already, <laughs> is dispensational uh, premillennialism. And the idea behind dispensational is stewardship. Um, there's one group that kind of looks at the Bible through covenants, and this one would look through it uh, at, at the Bible through the lens of like eras. So God doesn't deal with every group in the same way. Every person that ever lives uh, and is just lives by faith. The just shall live by faith in any era. But God doesn't deal with us the way he dealt with um, Adam and Eve or, or Noah or Abraham or the Jews. That's the idea that he... He is always dispensing his grace by faith, but it's in different forms and fashions. And covenants are involved, but in this case, what the dispensational pre-millennialists would believe would be that um, the, the church age uh, gives way to uh, a tribulation. But before the tribulation, the church is taken out. So the... The return of Christ would be one event with two kind of aspects in the sense that the church is taken out. And then when the Holy Spirit in, embodied by the church is taken out, then uh, the tribulation will happen. It will be very Jewish at nature, uh, even though it will affect the whole world. Jeremiah calls it the time of Jacob's trouble where God will judge the earth and the Jews and he will uh, ready them for the Messiah that they missed the first time around. And then at the end of the seven years uh, tribulation, Jesus will come back physically with the church. It has been taken up. And then the celestial 
and the terrestrial, the, the heavenly and the earthly will be together for a thousand years with Christ ruling and reigning. But what he'll do during that thousand years is, is fulfill all of his promises to the Jewish people while we're all mixed in there together. And, uh, and he'll then uh, set up uh, a new heaven and a new earth following that thousand years. And so there's a future redemptive plan for uh, Israel in that one, unique only to that view. Then there's a fifth one. And many of you might find yourself in this particular category, and that's panmillennialism. And that's, I don't know what's going to happen, but God's in control, so everything's just going to pan out. <laughs> you know? And, and that's, that's, that's uh, somewhat humorous, more humorous than my jokes about amillennialism and postmillennialism. But th the problem with that is Jesus said, I'm going away, and, and when I go away, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and then I'm going to come back to get you. And then one out of every seven verses in the New Testament reference the coming back to get you. One out of every seven. So he took enough time for it to matter more to him than it's just all going to pan out. And so in a, in a way, the, the return of Christ is the completion of the gospel. Uh, because if he doesn't return physically and practically, uh, if we don't have resurrection and a resurrected existence at as our hope in our future, then, then Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, we're of all people most pitiable. Like, instead of being here, I should be at the Elks Lodge. I could be doing something else if there's not a future hope attached to this deal. So uh, that said, then, I'm going to present to you just quickly why we're going to take the premillennial dispensational approach. And, and that's, uh, that's in these bullet points, and this is my understanding. Um, I believe it takes prophecy literally unless obviously allegorical, which is the way I read the Bible. That's the way I think it was meant to be read. Secondly, um, this particular uh, pathway believes God is true to his everlasting covenants. If he told Abraham that he was going to make an everlasting covenant with him that's attached to the land, that's everlasting. And if he told David that there was going to be an everlasting ruler, that's everlasting even though the Jews weren't faithful to the, the covenant, the law of Moses. It also then distinguishes between the church and Israel, which I think is much easier to see in our era than any other. Had I grown up in the Middle Ages, I'm sure I would be an amillennialist. But it's much easier for me to understand what Scripture says literally because there's a nation of Israel in front of me, and so it helps me take God at his word that there is a difference uh, in the millennial kingdom between how God's going to deal with his church and, and Israel. It also views the rapture or the taking away of the church as imminent. Uh, it sees that God could call his church up at any moment, yet there are things that must happen before Jesus returns physically. And then finally, I'd say this. Personally, this is the way I approach all doctrine, uh, even if I'm somehow getting it wrong. And that is that um, this particular idea about the millennial kingdom most closely reflects the Bible's overall portrayal of God. And if, if we're going to study a doctrine, it, it needs to most closely reflect what the whole of the Bible portrays about God. So you may not believe that, and if that's the reason that you believe from another uh, you know, viewpoint, then good for you. Because this isn't necessarily salvific. But if it's just because you've been taught this or you don't like another idea, that's no reason to have an ology, right? It, it needs to be the avenue by which we most see Jesus and God's overall character reflected. So with that is the longest introduction in human history. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1, which may be one of the most famous chapters in all of the rather obscure prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 1 the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones and then he that's God caused me Ezekiel to pass by them all around and behold there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry and he said to me son of man can these bones live so I answered <laughs> Ezekiel's been around God enough to know the game. Now he goes, oh, Lord, you know. <laughs> uh, 
I like this. By the way, I'm always a little suspect of people who the longer they walk with the Lord, the more they think they know. Because really, I think the more you walk with God, the more you realize I don't know squat. So that said, Ezekiel's learning some stuff. And again, God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. That statement used 50 times exactly, 70 sometimes, some version of it in the prophecy of Ezekiel. So I, that's Ezekiel, prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. And the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over, but there, there was no breath yet in them. And also he, that's God, said to me, Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So Ezekiel, who's no stranger to strange things, prophesied as God commanded him. And breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, notice this, an exceedingly great army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our, our bones are dry, our hope is cut off, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord, Behold, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. And I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. And then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Now we look at this section. We have the prophecy of the Valley of Dry Bones, which we know relates to Israel. Israel was a nation that was dead, deported by Babylon, literally thousands slain, dry bones, living, uh, you know, forever without burial in a field. That's where they were put. And so this, this imagery was on the people's minds that were left. As they'd been deported, they would have seen the slain over the fields. God says to Ezekiel, the people think there's no hope. We're just dead, dry bones as a nation, but I'm going to reestablish you. I'm going to breathe new life into Israel, and they will be uh, nationally and spiritually restored. Now, we live in some of the most exciting times in human history. As you study eschatology, it should get you excited for the return of Jesus. It's supposed to do two things. It's supposed to cause you to live pure lives and get ready for Jesus, and it's supposed to make you expectant of his return. We've told you that from my perspective and the perspective that we take from the platform up here that uh, Israel is God's uh, time clock for Jesus' return. And so we live somewhere probably right in smack dab in the middle of verses 12 and 13 of Ezekiel chapter 37. God has given Israel a land and brought them back, and he uh, has made them live, but they do not have his spirit, uh, his spirit embodying them, and they don't know that he is the Lord. So we know historically that this has happened. It, it happened uh, 1948. And by the way, uh, Israel is on uh, the front page of every newspaper, if there still is one that exists. But for sure, electronically, if you want to pull uh, Israel up, they're going to be in every uh, news feed around the world this weekend because yesterday, for the first time in 50 years, they were invaded. Um, they haven't had this kind of military, large-scale operation going on uh, since uh, 1973. Invaded on uh, the historic day, 50 years from the time they were last invaded. And what happened was they have a little spot down at the bottom of Israel called the Gaza Strip. 
And uh, it has been infiltrated and taken over by Hamas terrorists. Hamas is just a, a front for uh, Iran, is all it is. It's, it's a terrorist group. Iran backs them. And so yesterday morning early, the nation of Israel that did not exist for 2,000 years, that God breathed life into dry bones, which has existed since 1948, was attacked uh, by Hamas in uh, air, land, and sea. They shot missiles in, and while they were doing that, they cut uh, fences and drove pickup trucks uh, with machine gun turrets on them into the land, and then uh, some uh, paraglided in. And uh, they actually inhabited, this hasn't happened, uh, in, in years and years and years, they inhabited the villages in the south. And so since yesterday morning, uh, the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, have been actively uh, cleaning out villages to the south, and what they're going to do is go back into the Gaza Strip and take back the hostages that have been taken. And so uh, here's the thing. It's on over there. It's on like Donkey Kong, they'd say. Uh, and here's the reason. Uh, the Israeli Defense Forces uh, spokesperson is saying, we will not stop every options on the table, which which when he's questioned, like, does that mean nuclear? Every options on a table, right? Which is probably directed at Iran. That said, that said, when we get to chapter 38 next week, there is a war that uh, precedes probably the, the, the tribulation or happens right at the beginning of it called the War of Gog and Magog. And uh, Iran is a key player in that war. So uh, that said, here we, here we go. Right now, the world's saying, oh, yeah, Israel should defend itself. But I guarantee you one thing. They're going to go far enough that the world will be like, they should have stopped, and world opinion will turn. Why is that? Well, world opinion has almost always been against the Jews, except for one key event, and that was the Holocaust. And if you go with us to Israel next year, and unless they're in all-out warfare, I will go to Israel. You don't have to go. But you don't have to say, oh, we're going to go to Israel. They'll either take care of this thing rather quickly or Jesus may be coming back. It could escalate. But either way, we'll either go to this Israel or go to the new Israel. But either way, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you don't, don't burn up my email. Are we going? Are we going? Like, um, but during the Holocaust, if you go to Israel, you're going to go to the... We call it the Holocaust Museum. The Jews hate that term because the word Holocaust means sacrifice. And they're like, we were no sacrifice. We were, we were annihilated. It was genocide. It's Yad Vashem. Uh, so we'll go to that museum. And what you will find there are pictures of valleys of dry bones in 1945. And three years later in 1948, there was a nation established after 2,000 years. Largely... The world was, for a brief period, sympathetic to the Jewish cause because of six million being slaughtered. So God, God used even tragedy to, uh, to initiate uh, what we see here in Ezekiel. So he breathed new uh, life into a nation. But I say we live in between verses 12 and 13 because they do not yet have the Spirit of God living in them. I told you uh, a couple weeks ago that 1.9% of Jews in Israel believe in Jesus as their Messiah, 1.9%. And uh, past that, you'd think, okay, well, they, they all are worshiping Jehovah. When you go over there, you will find that nearly 70% of all Jews living in Jerusalem do not even believe in God. They're mostly atheistic. They, they do not believe. They do not know. And so, we live in the beginning of the fulfillment of this uh, particular prophetic uh, verses here, these verses. Now, um, before we go on, then, uh, I love all that. I love the fact that here's, here's what Israel tells us and what's going on there. Get ready. Don't get caught with your spiritual pants down. Okay, Jesus could be coming back. That's the idea. He's like, hey, shake the cobwebs loose. It's It's on. Now, past this, this valley of dry bones, it's a beautiful picture of our own story. 
And I'd say that Ezekiel, you know, prophesied last chapter about a new covenant. And, and this is our story. We live in the new covenant. I will, verse 26 of Ezekiel 37, give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you, and I'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I'll give you a new heart, a heart of flesh, and I'll, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and um, you'll keep my judgments and you'll do them. And so we've been grafted into this. We talked about that. In Ephesians, Paul writes uh, in the second chapter, verse 1, and, and you, to Christians, the Ephesian Christians, he that's Jesus made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature then children of wrath, just as others. And then here's one of those big buts in the Bible, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved through faith, and he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that's our spiritual story. Dry bones uh, given sinews and flesh and made alive uh, by the Spirit of God. Past that, God would say that uh, he would breathe new life into these bones by his Spirit. And we were made alive by a new Spirit, just as we read. And that word breath is beautiful because it actually has a connotation of breath, wind, or a spirit all in one, and it's from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end, because back in, in Genesis chapter uh, 2, that uh, God, it, the word is ruach, and that's not how you say it. It's, uh, you know, with the, the Hebrew, it's supposed to have a ha huh in there. It's got ha, huh, ha. Huh. Uh, I was telling first service, when we go to Israel, the guides, the Jewish guides love to ask us, hey, how do you say this word? Like, here's, here's this word I say, that's Hazor. They go, ha, ha. Or, you know, or however they say it. <laughs> so anyway, I don't have it. Um, but it's Ruach. And um, in Genesis 2, 7 says, when God uh, formed man from the dust of the ground, he Ruached or he breathed life into him and man became a living being. He, can't, he became a living being uh, spiritually, uh, physically, uh, Genesis 2, 7. And so there God walked with man in the cool of the day, and yet man broke fellowship. And so now God's on the hunt for man again. And yet when you get to John, you have the same kind of word, but it's in the Greek now, not the Hebrew, and it's pneuma. And uh, it also means breath, wind, or spirit. And John had told his disciples, he said, look, I am with you, but I will be in you. So they're all waiting for this to happen. They're waiting for, they're waiting for him to to do what he's supposed to do. And, and what they got was he died. And then he rises again and they can't figure it all out. So they're hiding. And Jesus shows up where they're hiding in John 20. And there are 10 of them left in the room. And, and Jesus, it says he pneuma or he breathed on them. And uh, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that's where the church was birthed, not Pentecost. I mean, that's, that's the church is like, it's like it's coming out party. It's, it's baptism, if you will. That's what it is. Those 10 disciples were the first people, those 10 apostles, the first people ever to have a new economy, a new covenant where the breath of life was breathed into them and they were made living beings. And so that's us. When we come to Christ, he breathes, he, he ruachs, he pneumas the Holy Spirit into us. This is our spiritual story. And we go from dead uh, to alive. And, um, and so he desires... That would be a great army. More on that in a little bit. Now, verse 15. This is a continuing prophecy. We're covering it in two sections. But again, verse 15, the word of the Lord came to me saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it uh, for Judah. So write Judah on a stick. And for the children of Israel, his companions, take a stick for Joseph uh, and write Ephraim on it for the house of Israel and his companions. And then join them one to another, to have one stick, 
And so these two sticks will become one. And when the children of your people speak to you saying, uh, will you not show us what you mean by this? What are you doing? Thus say the Lord, uh, says the Lord, surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I'll join them with the stick of Judah and make them one stick. And they will be in my hand. That's what God says. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. And then say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And notice this, I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, the mountains that were prophesied of to be desolate before, and one king shall be king over them all. That's key. And they shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them. And then they will be my people, and I will be their God. David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and, and do them. And then they shall dwell in that land I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt. They shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever. My servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. And it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. Notice that. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. Verse 27, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they will be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. All right, so what's happening here is, is Ezekiel's got another uh, sign act, some street theater. He's supposed to take two sticks. On one, he writes the name Judah for the southern kingdom, and on the other one, he writes the name uh, Ephraim for the northern kingdom, uh, a.k.a. Israel. And so historically, what happened is the kingdom of Israel was set up united under King David. His son Solomon reigned over a united kingdom. Then when Solomon died, his son Rehoboam was a turd, and so he uh, lost the kingdom. It split <laughs> before he ever got gone. So um, <clears throat> there was a guy named Jeroboam, took 10 tribes and went to the, the north, established um, capital city, a, a city called Samaria. Um, and then to the south, there were uh, two of the 12 tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And so throughout the history of the kings and chronicles, the south is typically called Judah. The north is called uh, Israel. But the largest tribe in the north is a tribe called Ephraim, and so sometimes it was called Ephraim. There you go. Is that simple enough? Now, uh, what he's saying is we're going to do this. We're going to take Israel or Ephraim on a stick, and we're going to take Judah and write that on a stick, and you're going to put it together, and you're going to symbolize what God's going to do in the last days. They're going to come back into the land, one nation. Okay, that hadn't happened since the time of uh, Solomon. It hadn't been the case. So uh, God would, would you reunite the kingdom of Israel as a nation, one nation, as we're going to see with one king. This didn't happen when they returned from Babylon. This didn't happen at the time of Christ. This, uh, they are one nation since 1948. They do not have one king, uh, and they are not spiritually in tune with that one king. So that said, we see the beginnings of this, and the rest is, is we would say, yet to come. And so David which is Messiah, which is Jesus, who they missed at his first coming, shall be their prince forever. And then he goes down through the list, listing what this Messiah will do when he uh, returns or when they know him. He'll, he'll make a covenant of peace. We read from chapter 36 what that covenant would be. They're going to step into that story in verse 26 here. Uh, they're they're going to have that Messiah tabernacle with them. He's going to dwell with them. Uh, that's verse 27. And then they're going to be set apart so that God will be glorified 
uh, when his sanctuary is in their midst forever. They're going to be sanctified, set apart, and then he's going to tabernacle with them, and that's going to be forever, verse 28. Now, the idea of tabernacling, or God with uh, the nation of Israel, is a theme all the way back uh, to Exodus. And so I just want to take a second and talk about God tabernacling with this nation and with people. Years ago, one of my spiritual mentors, in fact, probably the most influential guy on me in, in my life spiritually is a guy named Dan Gordon. And uh, he passed away 2015. Uh, but the first 10 years I was planning a church when I left San Diego, he called me every week. And every week we talked for an hour and every week he would talk about his grandkids. Then he would talk about Duke basketball and then he would talk about church. And then we'd talk about spiritual things or whatever he was studying in that order. He completely dominated the conversation. And I loved every minute of it. And uh, so right before he died, um, he called me one week and he's like, oh man, I've just been, I've just been loving my study through Exodus, which by the way, most people don't say, you know, I mean, you know, most people are enduring Exodus or skipping Exodus, you know, I'm taking a mulligan, hopping straight to Joshua. But um, he said, hey, I was just looking at the tabernacle. And he was like, man, the tabernacle is unbelievable. You know the tabernacle is a picture of a human body? I was like, what? He goes, yeah, the tabernacle was, was, was covered with skins. And then that was held up by a skeleton, ribs and, and sockets and all this stuff. And then if you peer through all the colors inside the tabernacle, uh, the gold, the, uh, the purple, the red, the blue, it's all colors of our organs and our, our, our muscles you know, everything we are internally. And then it was, it was uh, dynamic in the sense that the spirit of the living God inhabited it. It was only alive by God's spirit. And it was, it was mobile. It's like, wow. I mean, there it is, God right in the middle of them, right? He camped right in the middle. And I was like, wow, that's, and that, that was added to my, 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 my already like, I was already blown away by the idea that, and I've shared this with some of you multiple times, that the tabernacle was essentially by dimensions and by how it was meant to move from one place to another. It was, it was a, a double wide trailer. I mean, have you ever thought about this? God chose to inhabit a nation in a double wide trailer. And, and some of you, you know, you don't understand trailer living. You know, some of you just never lived in the trailer. But I was telling first service, we... The first home I really remember was 1978. We bought a brand new, I think it was 12 by 60 or 64, single wide trailer. And they say sense of smell is the greatest uh, trigger to memory. I can remember being getting ready to go into to kindergarten and they're, they're like strapping our, our single wide trailer down with the cable so it doesn't blow away in the tornado. And, I'm, and it doesn't have steps. We're not moved in. But the, and I walk up and the door's open and the smell from the new carpet, I can still remember, like that. I mean, it was strong. It was, it was like, wow, we got a brand new trailer home. And, you know, for years, the trailer home, you, don't, you always, make, it could move at any time, right? Just like the, t it could move because there was a tongue on it. And I knew there was a tongue on it because if you'd run around the edge of the house too fast, you'd trip over, bang your shins, pile up. And I knew we were fixed to stay when dad took a cutting torch and cut the tongue. Now you got a, now you got a home. You cut the tongue off that sucker, now you got a stationary home. You plant it. Uh, but then we weren't because eventually we <laughs> welded the tongue back on and sold it to somebody else when we moved. <laughs> but that, that said, then you stick two of those suckers together, now you got your home. You know? And if you want to move them, it's a little harder. You just cut them down the middle and you drive them down the road with the oversized load sign on it. And you put there, you, and, and that's God, man. Imagine, imagine the imagery. That's what God did. He came from heaven to earth, and then he chose to live in a mobile home, a double-wide mobile home, right in the middle of his people. And, and when you think about that, you're, it blows me away because when, uh, they, wanna, they would like to have, David says, man, this tabernacle is not good enough for you. We need to build you a temple. And God, God said, did I ever ask for a temple? But because your heart is to do it, I like your, I like your heart. I like the way you're thinking. You can build me a temple. Once they get the temple, it becomes their undoing because now they worship the temple. They were going to worship the tabernacle. 
because it was just a mobile home. Double wide, but it's still a mobile home. Get you a, get you a big old brick deal and cover it with gold. Now, you know, stones, gold. Now you're going to worship it. And so it becomes their undoing. So beautifully enough, when you get to Hebrews and God explains in Hebrews 9 and such that, uh, that heaven, um, it, it's just uh, embodied in or it's seen through the, not the temple, but he chooses the tabernacle. When God chooses to define what heaven uh, looks like, he chooses the tabernacle instead of the temple. Even though the temple does, does embody or does show the same things. The holy of holies, the holy place, the outer courtyard, the sacrifices, the smells, the lights, the bread. I mean, but it's the tabernacle he chooses. Which, which leads me to this. God's story is he tabernacles with man. And so uh, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it's the, uh, the word, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And then you drop down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and he dwelt or he tabernacled with man. There he was. He's with his people. Uh, unfortunately, that chapter tells us that he came to his own, but his own received him what? Not. Now, uh, for those who will receive them, he gave them the right to become the sons of God. That's the story all there in John chapter 1. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says that, hey, do you not know that the Spirit of God as a believer dwells or tabernacles in you? We're this one group. Now, you talk about living in a great era. We're the one group that gets to have the Spirit of God tabernacling inside of us. That's why I went away. He said, if I go away, it's going to be better for you because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to convict you. He's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. He's going to teach you. He's going to regenerate you. So Paul would say in 1 Corinthians, you can't defile this sucker. This body's the temple or the tabernacle. It's the dwelling place is the idea of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, when you get to Revelation, at the end of the story, this is one of the capstone statements of the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. Jesus says the tabernacle of God is with men. God is with men and he will tabernacle or he will dwell with them. And that's why uh, he finishes up the story. That's why he's preparing a place to dwell, to tabernacle with, with men for, for all of eternity. And so this leads me to two concluding thoughts quickly. The first one is this. The Jews missed Jesus, their Messiah, at his first coming, largely because they were looking for love in all the wrong places. They largely, they had made up an idea of, of the Messiah that wasn't biblical. And a lot of it had to do with their wants, their needs, so they thought, felt needs, and, and the oppression they were experiencing. And so uh, Jesus showed up and he wasn't who they believed he would be. And I, I don't want to throw stones because I really, sometimes I stay up at night and I sweat thinking, if I was a Jew when Jesus showed up on this earth, I'm afraid given my personality, I would have missed him. I would have missed him. Because he definitely wouldn't have fit. You know, I, was, I was brought up religious. So sometimes when you're brought up religious, you got just enough stuff to be real dangerous. And the religious people were the ones missing him. The people that weren't religious didn't have a problem. They, they got it. The religious people had made, uh, when they had married their religion with politics, they had really decided that they knew what was coming and they missed the whole deal. And Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, verse 13, you guys, through your tradition of men, you make the word of God of no effect. Boy, for me and you, if you know Jesus and you walk with Jesus and you study the word of God, one of the most dangerous uh, possibilities is that we make the word of God of no effect by tradition. We think we got him all figured out. And this is why, by the way, when we think about ologies, the studies of, I spent lots of years studying ologies. <laughs> I, can, I can spout off some ologies. I try to do it in layman's terms, but my whole life has been studying ologies. Um, I'm thankful for systematic theology and biblical Theology, and I'm thankful for the pneumatology and soteriology and eschatology and harmatology and all the ologies. But the reality is, uh, ologies, the systematic study of God, 
theos, uh, theology, became a thing in 1200 A.D. Before people just read their Bible and followed Jesus. So I'm for all theologies, but here's what happens. We love to put God in a box because he's more understandable that way. So I have this idea, and then I understand God to be here, and that makes me feel good because now I understand God. And anybody that doesn't understand that or see it that way, now they they make me a little scared, you know, because they're outside of my God box. And then what I do is I run away or I get combative. And, and, and here's what really happens. I miss Jesus. I miss him. Because believe me, God isn't going to ever be put in a box. So I don't want to miss my chance to tabernacle with Jesus. And I don't want you to. And truthfully, in a crowd this size, there's some people who don't know Jesus in here. There are some people who don't have Jesus in their hearts. That's what we want for you to invite Jesus into your life. But then as we walk with him, there are all kinds of situations. I wish this wasn't the case that I just paint Jesus out of or keep him at arm length or don't believe that he's actually actively working or bigger than this thing I'm involved in. And the truth is Jesus is right there dwelling, tabernacling in the midst of everything. So uh, I don't want to miss uh, Jesus in the way he tabernacles with me. And then finally, this thought, uh, I, you know, I, you might write this down because I put a lot of time. When I put a lot of time into things and, and then I just want to share with you, I came up with this all by myself. This is the kind of stuff I come up with when it's all by myself. That's dry bones and dead sticks don't struggle. They don't. They, they, don't, they don't struggle. Um, but armies are made to struggle. There's one thing armies are made to do, and that's struggle. So spiritually, God breathed new life into Israel and by the way, if you want to over-spiritualize the thing, they have one of the, the baddest motor scooter armies in the history of the world. Right now, they're calling up 100,000 reservists. It's bad motor scooters over there. They do not joke around. They're not the biggest, but when they want to, they are the baddest. But in like manner, uh, 2 Timothy tells you and I that God... He called us and fashioned us as soldiers of the cross. And most of us hope that God called us into like spa treatment. You know, I just like to get a little massage, work on my lower back just a hair. And maybe, maybe there's, you know, there's not as many metrosexual men in this room, but maybe just like a, a man, a, a petty or a manny. Sam, Sam says he'd like one. You know, some of you in the closet are getting a little buff and done, you know, and you, um, but the truth is that's not what he called us to be. Everything about our culture and our hearts say, I'd just like to take it easy. You know, I'd really like to just have it as good as possible and then go to heaven and be with God for eternity. But God called us to be an army. He said, he said, endure as a good soldier, endure hardship as a good soldier soldier like all of military training is so you can learn to endure as a good soldier so that you can then struggle when it is necessary and so uh, here's the deal if you don't have any spiritual struggle if there's not very much or, or none you might not have any spirit because i always misquote it it i thought i'd give frederick Douglass some credibility and give him some run today because I always say where there is no struggle there is no life which is true but also Frederick Douglass actually said the proper quote from the great abolitionist if there is no struggle there is no progress but there's definitely no progress if there is no life and progress by its very definition admits that we are getting better than we were which is hard for some of us to admit that every little bit of our life is God progressing us from what we were to what we already are, oddly enough. What we will be is what we already are positionally, but practically we progress. And progress is hard. And by the way, 
Learning anything that's worthwhile is a struggle. If you don't struggle, you're not learning very much. And yet if you are, if spiritually you're getting your hiney whooped right now, guess what? You're alive. And one day there won't be any more struggle. We're reading it. So, Father God, we pray that you would give us the ability to endure struggle. And, Lord, that you would give us the ability to revel in the word of God, which is being lived out literally before us uh, across the front pages of news. And we also then, Lord, ask that you'd please um, help us not miss uh, tabernacling with you. Lord, we pray that if people uh, don't really know that your spirit lives within them, they'd fix that today. Come down and pray with one of us or they'd just in their heart, just invite you in. There'd be new life breathed into a bag of a valley of bones. And Lord, we pray if any of us that have the spirit of God within us have shut you out of anything, Lord, help us to let you in. Help us not miss you. Help us not see you as incapable of being or dwelling in that deal. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you guys stand?